The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. And that's what he's looking for. He's looking for those who are willing to just say, I'm going to make a covenant. This is a move of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to jump in the river and I'm going to stay in the river. Are you willing to make that kind of commitment? Because I remember when the, the first time we experienced this, this current visitation was 1994. And actually, I experienced it at the Anaheim Vineyard before I did in Toronto. We were at the healing conference in January of 1994. And um, it was just wild. There was a lot of manifestation. In fact, there was a lot of laughter going on during the worship. It wasn't like anyone was preaching, but it just fell on like 4,000 people attending. And I remember the laughter was sweeping around the auditorium. And uh, during that time, I have to, in, in my book, I share, say goodbye to powerless Christianity. I was ready to quit the ministry. Because in 1993, even though I had received my master's, my doctorate at Fuller, I just felt like a failure as a pastor. And, uh, and I was just uh, uh, turned off by all the politics of the church. And, uh, and I told my wife, I said, honey, we're going to put our house up for sale. And, um, and we're going to buy a house in Colorado Springs. We're going to move to Colorado Springs. We're going to take the equity that we made in the investment in Southern California, invest in a place that's less expensive. And... Um, and then I said to her, and you could get the dog that you always wanted. But let's train that dog to bite anyone carrying a Bible. How many know, for me to say that to my wife, that's pretty bad. I was not doing well. And, uh, and I wasn't. I wanted to quit the ministry. So in 1993, you know, I was fighting depression. I mean, how depressed was I? I had to exercise faith to move from depression to discouragement. <laughs> that's pretty bad. And so... Anyway, we wanted to quit the ministry, just leave Southern California. But then um, I heard about the uh, healing conference in Anaheim. And so my friend Lou Engel and I went to a, that conference. And we're sitting all the way in the balcony on the other corner of the auditorium. And as the laughter is just going around the auditorium, Lou nudges me and says, the laughter is coming towards us. And I said to him, I said, I'm not going to laugh. Uh, you know, I, I felt like this was a sociological thing, a psychological thing that was going on. All my education had caused me to rationalize this manifestation of laughter. I thought it was social proof. <laughs> so, so I said, I'm not going to laugh. But you know the mercy of God and the goodness of God, because when the Holy Spirit hit our section, I felt myself getting inebriated. This is during worship now. And everything was funny. And I could not stop laughing. I tried to fight it, but, but God just overwhelmed me with his goodness. And, and I could not stop laughing for a good 20 minutes. I mean, I was laughing so hard, I fell out of my seat. I'm on the floor laughing. There was a guy sitting in front of me who was bald. For whatever reason, his bald head looked so funny to me. And he was a total stranger. And I leaned over and I began to massage his head. That's how drunk I was. And so, so I, when, when it subsided, I said to Lou, I said, Lou, you know, here we experienced the Jesus people movement, the charismatic renewal, and, uh, but never anything like this, you know, the manifestation and laughter. This was all new, even though I've been walking with the Lord as a charismatic since uh, 73, 74. But I knew in my spirit, because the depression lifted off of me, I wasn't depressed anymore. Something had lifted and I told Lou, I said, Lou, this is a move of the Holy Spirit. Even though this was January 1994, and we didn't have the history of Toronto yet, and to look at it from a historical perspective, from a macro perspective, I said, this is the move of the Holy Spirit. I said, Lou, we need to make a covenant right now. We're going to jump in this river and stay in the river. Now, you have to understand what that means. Because in Ezekiel chapter 47, there's a beautiful prophetic picture of an angel taking the prophet Ezekiel into the river that flows from the temple to the Dead Sea. There's no such river. This is, a, this is a prophetic metaphor. And he takes him ankle deep, knee deep, and waist deep. And there's been a lot of teachings on different things that, you know, the knee represents prayer and uh, waist deep represents, you know, being fruitful and all that. I, I don't get that because that's not what the text says, you know, I think it's reading into the text, but 
But here's the point I want to make. Whenever you go into a river, even if the currents are strong and you even go in waist deep, you're still in control. You can walk out. I had the privilege of taking my son, who is 32 years old now. He's, um, he's um, a pastor in our church. For his 30th birthday, I took him to Alaska to the, to the Kainai River, which is the most famous river for catching Alaskan king salmon. Uh, nine out of the 10 largest king salmon have been caught in that, uh, in that uh, river. And we caught ours. I caught a 70 pound, he caught a 69 pound. It was absolutely amazing. It was just a prophetic you know, thing. But you're only allowed one fish. That's your limit. And so what you can do and catch unlimited is what's called sockeye salmon. And what you do is you, you get into weighted boots and you walk out to the Kainai River and you, you as the salmon is uh, going upstream, you just hook them. There's no bait, you hook them. <laughs> and so Gabe and I, we got all dressed up and we're walking out. When I felt the current waist deep, the current was so strong, I started to freak out. I just envisioned myself tripping and the boot filling up and me being dragged down the river. And I said, Gabe, you know, I'm, I'm content. I caught my king salmon. I said, I'm happy. You go ahead and do it. This is a young man's sport. And so you go ahead. And he had a great time. But here's the point. I was able to walk out and walk back to the shore waist deep. But the angel leads Ezekiel that is so deep and the current so strong that he can't even swim across it. What is that a picture of? You have totally surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Is that you have given up all control and this is what God is looking for. And it's not just giving up the drugs and the pornography and sexual immorality. It's giving him your future. It's giving him your family. It's giving him your ministry. How I many know it's not your ministry? Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's being willing to do whatever the Holy Spirit tells you. That's where the Holy Spirit will land. He's looking for hearts like that to visit. And when you become a carrier of that, so we made a covenant. I didn't know it was going to be tested so quickly. Because even though we said we're going to be in this river, we're going to host the Holy Spirit, we're going to, we made this covenant, all of a sudden, Lou begins to prophesy to me, he said, we need to move into Mata Auditorium, the largest auditorium in the city of Pasadena, and we need to host the Holy Spirit in nightly meetings like, you know, Toronto was. This is a number of months later. This is after we had gone up to Toronto. But he said, we need to do that. He started to prophesy that to me. My wife said the same thing. He said, we need to move into Mata Auditorium. Here's the problem. Mount Auditorium is arguably the largest auditorium in Pasadena. It seats around 4,000. And, you know, it's been sectioned off, and, 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 uh, but still it's the largest auditorium in Pasadena, larger than the Pasadena Convention Center. But to rent that for nightly meetings was 35000 a month. It could have been 350000 We just didn't have the money. I mean, you know, we had just started H Rock Church in April of 1994. Now, you know, it's near the end of... Uh, uh, of uh, 94, and as we're going into 95, I'm getting these prophetic words about moving into Mata Auditorium. I said, Lou, there's no way. We, we only bring in a few thousand a week for tithes and offerings. We can't afford 35,000 a week. And, and so they were giving me these prophetic words, but, but you know, I was resisting that because of just the, the, the amazing uh, challenge of raising that kind of money on a monthly basis. Then I got a phone call from a good friend of mine who's been a prophet to me for years, James Gall. He still is. He's part of our international apostolic team. How many have heard of James Gall? Well, James is a dreamer. He's a seer. And he had a dream of me and called me up and said, Jay, I had a dream of you. And uh, I don't know what this dream means, but I saw you holding a bottle of applesauce. And the name of the applesauce was Mott's Applesauce. That's a brand name, Mott's Applesauce. <laughs> Does, do you know what that means? I said, well, James, I said, Sue, my wife, and Lou, they've been prophesying to me that we need to move into Mott Auditorium. Same spelling, M-O-T-T. But James is, is 35000 a month, and we don't have the money. We're just a brand new church. And he began to prophesy, now I understand what that dream is all about. You're to possess Mott Auditorium. Yeah. And you're, and, and, um, and you're going to have tremendous fruit in that auditorium because applesauce is fruit, right? And, and he said, don't worry about the finances. God's going to provide. Yes. And so we said, okay, this is what it means to 
The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. So if you're faced with that, are you hearing what I'm saying? So we said yes. We said a big yes. We didn't know where the money was going to come from. So in April of 95, we started to host nightly meetings like Toronto. And they were small. It started off small. And, uh, you know, 150 people. On the weekends, maybe we would go up to 300. But here's what happened. The offerings that we took each night was absolutely amazing. The first month, over 35,000 came in. And we were in the black. The next month, we were in the black. That was April. And then in May, on May 28th, that's when the glory fell. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. Three months into the nightly meetings, and, and not once did we go in the red. Through the offerings, and I was thinking, see, I was, I was just thinking of just what, I was putting all the uh, burden upon our local church, and we just had a, a new church. It just started off, and it was primarily young people, and we didn't have the budget for it. And looking at the natural, instead of just saying yes to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. And that's what he's looking for. He's looking for those who are willing to just say, I'm going to make a covenant. This is a move of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to jump in the river and I'm going to stay in the river. Are you willing to make that kind of commitment this afternoon? I'm seriously, I, I felt like the Lord is saying, I'm going to ask you to make, because here's the key to success. The key to success is not for you to do your own thing. But look, you know, I got my, uh, my doctorate at Fuller and, you know, it was almost like going in for an MBA because they said, they taught you how to do strategic planning and how to do a marketing plan for your church and, and how to set five-year goals and 10-year goals and, 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 you know, it was just like, you know, any kind of secular education. They didn't teach me about being prophetic. But thank God for John Wimber, who was a mentor in Southern California, and his life verse was John 5, 19. And that verse says, Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. So I learned early on in this move of the Holy Spirit, instead of setting my own goals and asking God to bless it, I began to... Just ask the question, what is the Holy Spirit saying? What is he doing? And once you discover what the Holy Spirit is saying, doing, you join the Holy Spirit. How many know the Holy Spirit is God? <laughs> How many know the Holy Spirit is always successful? God's always going to be successful. He's never going to fail. So when you align yourself with the Holy Spirit, you'll be successful. And so all of a sudden, we start to do things differently. We begin to see what is the Spirit of God? Uh, saying to us. And that's why in Revelation 2 and 3, it says seven times, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Our responsibility is to hear what the Spirit of God is saying and then to obey him or to see what the Father's doing and obey him. I love John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. How many of you are a sheep of Jesus Christ? Come on. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me or they obey me. That's the key.